Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core, and this here is the Ambernic RG552. Now this device first released in December of 2021, and the reviews for it, including my own, were not very stellar. And that's because there's a lot to complain about this device. Number one is the price itself. It is over $225 retail. On top of that, the CPU inside the device is not efficient. What that means is it generates a lot of heat and therefore requires an active cooling system, and together that combination means you're not going to get great battery life. Furthermore, it has poor ergonomics when using the analog sticks combined with the inline shoulder and trigger buttons. The device ships with 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi, but the lack of 5 GHz or Bluetooth means it's not going to be great for streaming or using with an external controller. And while the device is capable of dual booting into either Android or Linux, the stock firmware experience on both of those operating systems left a lot to be desired. And really, in general, this device just cannot compete with the other offerings we have available in the market. Something like the AYN Odin Lite runs for about the same price, $199 plus shipping, but is probably two to three times more powerful. Even the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, which comes in at $99 plus shipping, is still more powerful than this device as well. And so you might be wondering, if this device has so many problems, why is it that I'm making a video that says this is my favorite handheld device for retro gaming? Well, that's what we're going to go over in this video today, because against all odds, I keep going back to the RG552 as my primary retro handheld. And so in this video, I'm going to spend some time going over some of my favorite features about it and why it is specifically that I use this the most. We'll also go over some of the tweaks I've done to get the most out of the RG552 as well. Now, I want to be super upfront about this right now. I'm not saying that this device is worth buying, especially for your specific use case. What I am going to show is that my experience with this device, where I focus mostly on 8-bit and 16-bit gaming is an incredible experience. And when I first got into this retro handheld scene about two years ago, if somebody had asked me to pay $200 plus dollars for this experience, I would have laid that money down no problem. Now before you start thinking I'm taking crazy pills here, let's jump right into the video. Okay, I'm going to block this video off into various chapters. I'll have them all time stamped in the timeline below. To start, we want to talk about the most prominent feature of the RG552, which is its screen. Now, the typical aspect ratio that you're going to find on a display like a TV or some of the more widescreen retro handhelds is going to be 16 by 9. And let's just use a resolution here of 1920 by 1080 as our baseline. Now, this resolution is not great for retro gaming. It does work well in some contexts. For example, it's great with PlayStation Portable, which is basically a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, and it's also great for streaming modern games onto a handheld as well. Now if you try to go back and play some of those classic retro consoles, things like Nintendo through the 16-bit era, you're usually going to be looking at a 4x3 or an 8x7 aspect ratio as you can see here. We also need to talk a little bit about scaling. Now scaling is when you take the original resolution of a console and then try to make it larger to fit the target display. Now you have two options here. You can either blow it up as much as you can to fill up the display, or you can do what they call integer scaling, which is when you blow it up by a factor of 1. So for example, when we take Super Nintendo and try to scale it up up as much as we can with integer scaling on a 1080p display, you can see that at max we get a 4x integer scale. That means if you want crisp and balanced pixels with your Super Nintendo image, it's going to have black bars on the sides and top and bottom of the display. Now one thing you could do at this point is do non-integer scaling, where you blow it all the way up as much as you can. And this will result in an integer factor that is less than 5x resolution. What this means is that the pixels will become unbalanced, and you'll have to do some other workarounds to make them work. Some examples of that would be by linear filtering, which is going to make the image very soft. Or you may have to use a shader or a filter, and none of those are really perfect. So on your typical 16x9 1080p display, you are going to have a compromised picture. Now same goes with other systems like the Game Boy Advance. This one had a wider 3x2 aspect ratio, and this one can do an integer scale of 6 times, and honestly it looks pretty good on a 16x9 display. You are going to get black bars on the sides and the top and bottom, but it's not going to be as bad as it is with 4x3. And so if you do try to scale it up without integer scaling, you will get a 6.75 scale. This will create some imbalanced pixels, but it won't be as bad is something like the Super Nintendo. And finally, if you try to do Game Boy or Game Boy Color, you can do a 7x integer scale here and it actually works out pretty well. The black bars on the side are going to be larger just because it's a more squarish design, but as you can see it does fill up most of the screen. And so just to kind of set the stage here, that's what you can expect from a 16x9 display. Now the RG552 on the other hand uses a 5x3 aspect ratio instead. It still has the exact same width of 1920 pixels, 
but it has more vertical pixels, 1152 altogether. And while that difference of 72 pixels vertically doesn't seem like a big difference, it really does matter when it comes to retro gaming. Now to start, if you were to use 16x9 content, something like the PSP, it's actually going to look just fine. You will get some small black bars at the top and the bottom, but otherwise you probably won't even notice. But when it really comes into play are those 4x3 systems like the Super Nintendo. Here you can see, instead of that 4x integer scale that we saw with 16x9, this can actually go all the way up to 5x. And so here we're going to get minimal black bars on the top and the bottom, and the black bars on the left and the right are going to be smaller as well. Here's a quick comparison against the 16x9 non-integer scaled Super Nintendo. As you can see, the black bars are larger on the left and the right, and you do have to deal with all that pixel distortion as well. Game Boy Advance is also incredible on a 5x3 display, it's going to allow you to have a 7x integer scale. And Game Boy and Game Boy Color actually have a perfect 8x integer scale, there's no black bars on the top and the bottom at all. Now what that means in a real world context is if you take a display that's about the same size but 16x9, we're going to use the Odroid Go Super as an example right here, you can see that the image is much larger than it is on the 16x9 one. On top of that, it's a perfect 5x integer scale, which means that everything is going to be nice and crisp. On the other hand, you're going to have to rely on bilinear filtering or filters and shaders for the Odrego Super. In fact, in order to get a 4x3 image that is of a comparable size to the RG552, you have to use a much bigger screen. For example, here the 6-inch AYN Odin is only a little bit smaller than the 5.3-inch RG552 screen. And so when it comes down to it, this screen is going to be really excellent when it comes to playing retro content on a handheld device. Even the devices that have a 4x3 aspect ratio display, something like the RG351MP as you can see here, really pales to the RG552. And so while I do think that if we got a 4.5 inch display that had a 4x3 aspect ratio, it might be my favorite over the RG552, right now it's no contest with the other devices on the market. If I want to play a 16-bit era or below system, I'm always going to pick the RG552. And that distinction gets even more prominent with the other systems, for example Game Boy Advance basically fills up the whole screen and it looks incredible. And same thing with the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Even though these are mostly a square aspect ratio, they still look great on the 552. So yeah, long story short, I'm a huge fan of the RG552 screen and that's one of the main draws for me when it comes to retro gaming. Now another thing that really kind of draws me to the RG552 is its size. It's not like a small pocketable device, but I do think it is probably one of the best in its class when it comes to those larger handhelds. It's a little bit smaller than the Nintendo Switch Lite as you can see here, but the size of the components, for example the D-pad as well as the face buttons are larger than you would find on the Switch Lite. Not only that, the controls on this are just excellent when it comes to retro gaming. These are modeled after the original Nintendo and Super Nintendo style controllers, and so they have that classic kind of rubber membrane feel to them. But in all honesty, I prefer these over those old controllers, because they have a lot more dynamic snap to them. Those old controllers were a little bit mushy over time, but these ones are nice and responsive. And so when it comes to playing classic games, I really prefer to use the D-pad and the face buttons on the Amronic device over most of the other retro handhelds that are available today. Now, by virtue of having the D-pad placement up top, this is a very D-pad centric device as well, which again, I find very fitting when playing classic systems. And while I do think that the analog sticks are too low on the device, I think they're just fine when you're only using the left analog stick in place of the D-pad. So if you are going to play an arcade game or something else like that, the analog stick is just fine. My major issues when it comes to the controls are the shoulder buttons. As you can see here, they are in line, unlike the stacked ones on the Nintendo Switch Lite. In combination with those lower analog sticks, it's not going to be fun to play first person shooters or to stream content or things like that. And so as funny as it may seem, my solution to that is to just not play those style of games on this device. Instead, as you'll see later, I focus only on the retro systems and D-pad centric gameplay. Also another thing I like about the size is that it's very compatible with the Nintendo Switch Lite cases. And you can find a ton of these on Etsy and eBay and Amazon, and so for $10 you've got a great case for the RG552. Personally I really like this Nintendo Switch Lite case, but I think it's been discontinued so you may have to find it on eBay used. Now even though this device boots into both Android and Linux, I primarily only use the Linux firmwares. And you have a few to choose from, but I personally use Jealous Custom Firmware for reasons that I'll show here later in the video. But if you want to see the other options out there, I have made dedicated videos to Bodicera 34 as well as the most recent version of Amber Alec. And these firmwares are great, but there are specific things about the Jealous firmware that I use in my own use case. So before we dive into the use case part, let me show you real quick how to install a custom firmware onto this device. 
To start, I've made a written guide for all of this so you can follow along at your leisure, but in that guide you'll have links to the Jealous website. Here, just scroll down to the installation instructions, it'll take you to the most recent release. Here, you want to scroll down to the bottom of the release page and then find the RG552 image file. Just go ahead and download this file, it's going to be about a gig altogether. Now, I recommend flashing this firmware onto a card of a reputable brand, something like SanDisk or Samsung, and I think 16 gigabytes is the perfect size. Now the RG552 has two SD card slots, so on the second slot you're going to want to put a larger card which is where you're going to store your games. I would say that 128 gigs is going to be great for everybody, but if you want to try and use a lot of CD based systems, you may want to go for 256 instead. And that's mostly because those systems have much larger file sizes. Now once you've downloaded the Jealous image file and you've inserted your SD card into your computer, we're going to use an app called Belena Etcher to flash it onto that card. And this is super simple, you just select the file from wherever you downloaded it from, and there's no need to unzip it or anything. Next for the target you want to select the SD card, make sure you don't pick a hard drive or something else like that because it will overwrite it. So essentially we're going to take the Jealous image and flash it onto our SD card, once we're good with that we're going to hit the flash button. It's going to come up with a prompt asking you do you really want to do this, and you say yeah man I want to do it. After that just kick back, it's going to decompress that image file, then it's going to flash it to the SD card, and then it will also validate the flash. And once it's done the app is going to eject the SD card so you can pull it right out of your computer and pop it into the RG552. Now this first time we're just going to boot it up without the other SD card inside, this is going to initialize the SD card, reformat the partitions, and then set up all of the backend system for you. And this is going to take a couple minutes altogether, but once you're in the tool screen here you can go ahead and press start, go down to quit, and then select shutdown system. Next we're going to put in that larger SD card into the other slot of the device. Now as we power on the device what it's going to do here is populate that card with a bunch of folders that you will use to add your BIOS and games files. Now if you'd like at this point you can turn off the device and eject the SD card. But in this case, before we do that, let's go into the network settings and set up our Wi-Fi. This is going to be an essential part of using Jealous because it'll allow you to do online updates. Which means that after flashing this card this one time, you'll never have to flash anything ever again. In fact, you can even transfer your files over Wi-Fi if you want to do it that way as well. And the Jealous website has instructions on how to set all that up. Now after you have the Wi-Fi connected, to update the software you'll go into system settings and then you'll see it right here where it'll say start update. Of course, because we just flashed the most recent version, we're not going to have any update available right now. Either way, that's the process to update your operating system. So let's go ahead and turn off the device now, take that SD card out, and put it back into our computer. And as we get into the SD card you can see it's been populated with a bunch of folders. This is where we're going to put all of our ROM files. Now before we start adding our games, I recommend adding a BIOS pack first. If you're not familiar with BIOS, these are system files that are necessary for some systems to run correctly. Now BIOS files are copyrighted, so you're on your own to find them, but chances are they may be on the SD card that came with your device. If not, I recommend googling the words RetroArch BIOS pack and you'll find what you need. Anyway, after you moved over your BIOS files, now we can start moving over our games. And again, you're on your own to source your own ROM files. But the setup here is pretty intuitive, you're going to take your game files, and then find the corresponding folder within your SD card. For example, with NES games, there's an NES folder. From there, all you have to do is just grab all your files and drag and drop. And from there you just repeat the process, you can do this as many times as you want, add a couple games, take them off, do whatever you'd like. Now if you get to a point where you're not quite sure if you're using the right game files or what folder to put them in, then I recommend going to the Jealous website. Here you'll find a table that will show all the different systems, and then it'll also show whatever emulators they use, the folder to put them in, and what file types are accepted as well. On top of that, if you go to the furthest column, it'll actually take you to the RetroArch page where you can see what specific BIOS files are going to be required as well. So this is probably going to be the most tedious of all the processes that we're going to do here today, but I did want to show you just how to do that from the ground up. And so after you're done with that, go ahead and eject your SD card, put it back into your device, and now let's actually get started. Now for me personally, I just threw everything on there, including systems that don't run really well on the Linux side, so for example I have some Dreamcast games on here. That's primarily because I want to use the same SD card when I boot it into Android. And so what I found, the best thing for me with this system on the Linux side is to actually hide the systems that don't play well. And so let me show you how I do that. You go ahead and press start to get into the main menu, go into game collection settings, and then systems displayed. Within here you can uncheck any of the systems that you don't want to have showing up in that main menu. The files 
files are still going to be there and they'll be fully accessible within the Android side, but this just kind of gives me a peace of mind that I'm only going to browse through all the systems that I'm actually going to play on the Linux side. I know it's kind of a weird workaround to just hide the things that don't play well, but it does allow me to razor focus on the systems that do, and I found that that makes me enjoy the device that much more. So now let's talk about some of those tweaks that I use that makes me prefer Jealous over the other two custom firmwares. For this, we're going to go into the game settings menu and adjust everything to the defaults. Now some of these have already been pre-configured, for example the core provided aspect ratio is the correct one here, and some of the others I just turn off by default just to be safe, like by linear filtering. Now the most important setting to me is this one here, it's called cores used. By default it's going to use all six cores that are available in the RK3399 chip, but the thing is two of those cores, which they call the big cores, are the most powerful but also very power hungry. And so instead what I like to do is turn off those big cores and only use the little ones. This is going to give us a quad core device that's not going to be as power hungry so it's going to have better battery life and the performance is still pretty good. For example when setting it to just the little cores and then also playing a pretty demanding game like the hardest to play Super Nintendo games, you can still get about 4 hours and 45 minutes of battery life. Playing that same game with all the cores is only going to give you about 4 hours altogether. So this is one of the main reasons why I prefer Jealous over the other custom firmwares. I love having the ability to make this change. Now some of the other settings that I like to change while I'm in here is I like to turn off the rewind and then only turn it on when I need it. I also like to turn on integer scaling and turn off RGA scaling. And then for auto save and load I like to have it only show states if it's not empty. And then finally I also like to turn off the shaders and filters. So we're just going to be running a very clean version of these games. Now if you want to do specific tweaks to a certain system, you would want to go into here, the per system advanced configuration. And the only other thing I would recommend checking out is the retro achievement settings, which we'll do here later in the video. For now, that's about all the changes I like to do within the game settings. Now there's one other adjustment I like to do, and this one's going to be under the UI settings. Here there's a couple things I like to change, for example the RetroArch menu driver. By default it's Ozone, but I prefer the XMB one which looks a little bit like a PS3. Additionally if you wanted to change the A and B layout in Emulation Station, this is where you could make that adjustment here. By turning this on it'll give you more of an Xbox style layout. And then finally if you want to see the frames per second as you're playing games, you can turn that on here as well. Okay so those are the main changes I like to make when first setting up Jealous. I'll have a list of other ones that I'll have in the written guide linked in the video description. Now the final change I like to do is actually within RetroArch, so we'll go into the tools menu and then start the 64-bit version of RetroArch. Now within here we're going to navigate to settings, then input, and then the hotkeys section. And the first setting here is called confirm quit. Now by default this is turned on, which means you have to press select and start twice to close out of a game. Now because we already have auto save and auto load set up, I actually prefer just to have it start and select one time. So for me personally I like to turn the confirm quit to off. That's just going to make getting in and out of the games that much faster. Now once you've made that change, go into the main menu here, go into configuration file and save current configuration. Now you're good to go. Okay, so now that we've gone through and set up the basics that I like to do with Jealous in the RG552, now let's talk about some of the specific tweaks I like to do to improve my gameplay experience. We'll start here with Super Nintendo first. We're going to run Yoshi's Island, which is one of the hardest Super Nintendo games to play, and as you can see here, running 60 frames no problem. If we press select and X, we'll get into the RetroArch menu, and within here, I'm going to go into the main menu, settings, and then the video settings. And what I want to do here is apply a video filter. These are very CPU intensive, but can provide a really nice effect on the screen. So here we're going to pick one of the Blarg filters. We'll do the S video one here. This will give the image a more classic CRT feel. And usually this will cause slowdown in a lot of handheld systems. But as you can see here, if we press select an R2 to bring up fast forward in RetroArch, you can see that the game will still run at 255 plus frames per second. That's an indication to me that there's a ton of overhead here and it's going to play at 60 frames no problem. In fact, we can stack on more CPU intensive effects and still get great gameplay. For example, within the quick menu here we can scroll down to the latency section. And within here we can turn on something called run ahead. What this basically does is reduce the input latency while you're playing. So not only is it going to look a lot like a CRT television as you're playing it, but it's also going to reduce the input delay so it feels like you're playing on a CRT as well. And if we turn on the fast forward, we can see it's still getting about 135 frames per second. So what this means is that we can stack all of these settings to get a really great gameplay experience. For example, you could even turn on rewind, which is a great function, but also CPU intensive. And so if you were to stack all three of these things, the CRT filter, the run ahead, as well as the rewind function, when you press fast forward, it's still going to give you about 115 frames per second. 
And so this is one of my favorite functions about the RG552. Not only does it scale these games beautifully on this big display, but it also allows me to play the games how I want. I can throw on the rewind or those filters and everything's still gonna play just fine. And that's a great place to be when you're playing your retro games because you can tailor your experience to what you want. Now, if you're big into retro gaming like me, there are some other tweaks that you can do to really improve your experience as well. We'll do this on the NES to show you some of the examples here in RetroArch. Now here I'm playing Mega Man 2 and this is a very clean image right here. So I'm not running any filters or shaders or anything else like that. And it is also integer scaled at a four by three aspect ratio. And as you can see, it looks great. The black bars are basically invisible at the top and the bottom. And the black bars on the left and the right are pretty minimal as well compared to a 16 by nine display. Now NES is my favorite system of all times. And for me, this is the best way to play it. It just looks gorgeous. But of course the NES had some limitations to it. One of those was that it was limited to the amount of sprites it could show at one time. And this is why you'll often see some flickering in a lot of those games that have a lot of things going on at once. Here you can see these fireballs are flickering. Now if you wanted, you could go through and actually fix this. What we want to do here is go into the quick menu and then we'll go into the core options. And within here there's an emulation hack section and here you can remove the sprite limit. Now if we go back to the game you can see that these fireballs are no longer flickering. Now, of course, if you want the most authentic experience, you can keep that sprite limit in there, but sometimes it's kind of cool to see how it would be in an ideal use case. Now, when you're using a side scroller on the NES, you will often see some artifacts on the right side. Now, these were usually cut off by the television, so you never noticed them back in the day, but now on a computer, they're very apparent. But luckily, there's something we can do within RetroArch settings to fix this as well. Again, we'll press select and X to get into the quick menu and we'll go down to core options. Now here within the video settings, you'll find one that says mask overscan horizontal. And so now as we scroll left and right with NES games, we're not gonna see that anymore. And so if you wanna play something like Super Mario 3, the combination of removing the sprite limit as well as that overscan option are gonna give you an ideal experience. But for me, it's not quite perfect. And a lot of that has to do with the button arrangement. Now, personally, I don't like using the B and A buttons while I'm playing Mario 3. It just feels kind of weird to hold down with the B button and then push to the right to the A. It's not quite the same as it was on the NES. And so instead, I like to use the Y and B function like it is with Super Mario All-Stars on the Super Nintendo. And so here, what we want to do is go into the quick menu and then go into controls. Within port one controls, we can now change the button layout to however we'd like. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make A the turbo A button and then X the turbo B button. And then from there, I can make B the A button and then Y the B button. I know that's kind of confusing to have me say it out loud, but just trust me, it's gonna work out just great. Anyway, once you've made those changes, go ahead and back out to the previous screen and then select manage remap files. Here, go ahead and save game remap file. What that means is every time you play Super Mario 3, it's now gonna be set up this way. And so now the B button is my jump button and the Y button is the run button. To me, this is a much more natural position for my thumbs and I prefer it this way. And of course, you can implement a remap like this to any other game or system, however you'd like to tailor it. Okay, another tweak I like to do personally is with Sega Genesis. The widescreen implementation of the Genesis emulator has gotten a lot better over the past year, to the point where a lot of games work really well. So within the system settings of Sega Genesis, I like to set that as the emulator. And then within the aspect ratio, I like to change it from the default 4x3 within Jealous to core provided. What this means is we'll let the emulator choose how wide to make the screen. Now what I recommend doing is jumping into a game, going into the quick start menu, go into core options and then video. And within here, there's gonna be an option that says extra columns to draw. Personally, I prefer to change this to two, but you could go all the way up to six or eight. For me, two just seems to be the sweet spot. It's gonna give you an aspect ratio that's very similar to the three by two aspect ratio of the Game Boy Advance. Now it's not gonna be perfect for every game and I don't think Aladdin is a great example because you will see some glitching on the left of this game. But in general, I would recommend trying this out with some of your favorite Sega Genesis games and see if you like to have them in that kind of wider aspect ratio. Okay, one more little trick I like to do with Sega Genesis as well. For this, a good example is gonna be Sonic Spinball. If you've ever played this game like I did back in the day, this game runs really slow. This is one of the later Genesis games and yeah, it just had a lot going on and it couldn't really keep up. So they kind of clocked it pretty slow with this specific game. Now, luckily with the magic of emulation, we can actually adjust this to be at a full 60 frames per second instead. So to do this, we're gonna go into the quick menu and then the core options here. And then next we'll go down to the emulation hack section. 
Now, much like with the NES, we have the ability to remove a sprite limit. So if you want to do that, you can turn that on. But the one I'm really looking forward to here is the CPU speed. We can actually overclock the emulated Genesis CPU. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set the CPU speed to 150 and then start up the game again. And as you can see here, the difference is night and day. In fact, it feels a little bit turbocharged based on what I'm used to from when I was a kid. But I found that I really like using it this way. Everything looks nice and smooth and just feels more natural. Of course, if you want to keep it exactly like how it used to be back in the day, then you're more than welcome to do that. But I thought this was a tweak worth sharing. When you combine that with the widescreen hack, this is just a really nice experience. Now some systems, like the Game Boy Advance, you don't need to do any manipulation at all. As you can see right here, running the default aspect ratio, it looks gorgeous. But one thing I did want to point out is the fast forward function works really well on this too. Using the default core within Jealous, you can get about 280 frames altogether when turning on fast forward. To me, I think that'll work really well if you want to kind of breeze through some Pokemon games. Okay, one of my other favorite functions about using retro handhelds are retro achievements. Now there are many handhelds that can do retro achievements, but I found that the combination of the screen and the controls and the performance plus retro achievements really pushes it over the edge for me. So let me show you how to set that up. We're going to go into the main menu here, enter game settings, and then go down to retro achievement settings. Here you want to turn on retro achievements, and then you want to add your username and password. If you don't have a username or password yet, you need to go to retroachievements.org and sign up for a free account. Either way, once you've added your username and password, you're actually good to go. Everything is now set up. And so now if we go and browse through our catalog, you'll see a little trophy next to some games. And if you see that trophy, that means that the game has retro achievements that are enabled. Now what you can do here is press the X button to bring up that game's specific options. And within here, there's an option to view this game's achievements. And from there, you can read the achievements that are available, and if they're colored, that means that you've already unlocked them. As you can see with Aladdin, I've gotten most of them already. And so to me, I found it to be a really fun thing is to check the achievements available for the game, and then sit down and say, okay, I'm going to unlock that one right now. I know a lot of people don't like achievements, but personally, I like to have that little bit of incentive to go back and play some of the classics. And when you earn an achievement, you'll see a little pop-up that comes down from the top that'll tell you what achievement you just unlocked. And so yeah, I find that to be pretty cool, but your mileage may vary. Okay, another thing I like about the Linux side of the RG552 is that these custom firmware support something called Portmaster. And Portmaster is an app that allows you to port over some of your favorite PC games, thanks to some really great reverse engineering dev work by some of the community developers. And so here in my ports menu, you can see just a sampling of some of the games that are now available for the RG552. Now this device in particular is not the only one that'll play these ports, but I have found that it's the one that plays these the best. And so certain games like Shredder's Revenge definitely plays the best in the RG552, and look at how gorgeous it is on that big screen. And so if like me, you're a fan of some of these classic PC indie games like Owlboy and Celeste and Shovel Knight, this is going to be a really great option. Again, it's not the only device that can play these games, but that big screen really makes it the best. Now I couldn't find a good place to insert this part into the video, but I did want to mention too that this is one of the only retro handheld devices that supports quick charging. What that means is you can use a power delivery plug to get this charged up and running in about an hour and a half altogether. Speaking of charging up, let's go ahead and take a break. We'll do a cat break here with my cat chicken. And if you're a longtime viewer of the channel, you know that she likes to jump on my lap while I'm filming, and anytime that happens, I like to just give her a little bit of glimpse of the camera too. Anyway, let's continue on with the video. Now, another thing I like about this device is the fact that it can play those higher-end systems if you want to. I know I've been focusing on only those retro 16-bit, 32-bit, and below, but that power does come in handy when you want to use it. Like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, this can dual boot in both Android and Linux. And when it comes to playing those higher-end systems, I definitely recommend using the Android side of the device instead. The emulators in Android are just much more optimized than they are in Linux. Now I have a whole custom firmware video, which I'll also have linked in my guide, which will walk you through the installation process for custom ROM images for Android. And those are going to give you access to the Google Play Store, a very clean image, and also better performance. And so if you want to see a demonstration of how those games will perform in Android, I recommend watching that video. But let me give you a quick roundup just so you can set your expectations. For Nintendo 64, 90% of the games are going to play upscaled at 720p, and the remaining 10 will play just fine at 480p. For Sega Saturn, you can play almost every single game at the original resolution and it'll look great. Dreamcast is pretty good but not the best. If you use the Redream emulator which has an auto frame skip enabled, you're going to be able to play about 95% of games at 480p no problem. 
And sadly, PSP is the one that probably still struggles even on Android. About half the catalog can play in a 2x resolution and it'll look fantastic. And about another 40% will play at a 1x resolution. That's going to look a little bit more muddied and pixelated, but it'll still run fine. And those top 10% of games, things like God of War or OutRun 2006, unfortunately those are going to have to run both at a 1x resolution and you're going to have to use frame skip in order to get it to be playable. So even though we're focusing on only the retro systems in this video here, there is an option to play all these other ones as well. And again, I recommend checking out that custom firmware video to see how to set up and use Android. Another thing you could do to improve performance on this device is to install your own 5 GHz Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip as well. Now this is going to require you to do some soldering, and so I actually sent my device over to Thor. This is footage from his work right here. And so what he did here is he took a 5 GHz Bluetooth Wi-Fi chip, and he just soldered it directly to the pads of where the old chip had been. Now this is way above my skill set, so I don't have a video guide for this, but there are written instructions which I will leave linked in the video description. And so if you want to improve things like the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capability of this device, there is a way. And finally, the last function I want to talk about with the RG552, one of my other favorite things about it is that it has the ability to do HDMI out. And so what this means, if you want to hook this device up to a TV or a monitor, you can have the display function there. And this is going to work in both Android and Linux. Now sadly, when you try to use Emulation Station within Jealous, it actually rotates everything sideways. Now this is something the team is aware of, and so hopefully there will be a fix to this sometime in the future. But when it comes down to it, it's only the navigation that's affected. When you actually are playing the game, there's no problem at all. Now that being said, you are going to be limited when it comes to external controllers. For example, within Jealous, they don't have external controller support, and they also don't have Bluetooth support. So you will be limited to playing it on the device like this if you do want to do that on Jealous. Of course, if you want to use the Android side, all that will be available. You could use a USB Bluetooth adapter to then connect wirelessly to a controller. Or you could also use a USB controller and do it wired. Either way, it's just nice to have a little function like this if you do want to play on a larger screen. Okay, so really that's about it for this video. I just kind of wanted to show you some of my use cases when it comes to the Ambernic RG552. And like I said in the beginning, this video is not meant to convince you to buy this device, because I don't think it's a good fit for many people. But I do think there's a sliver of users out there, people from like my generation who grew up playing 16-bit and below systems, who may find this really attractive. And so even though yes, I completely agree, the RG552 is too expensive and underpowered, it just so happens to also be the device that I play the most. Now if you're looking for price to performance, say for example you're on a budget and you only want to spend say $200 and $250 on a handheld and just be done, then I definitely don't think the RG552 is going to be the best for you unless you only want to play 16-bit and below. But like I said, the experience of playing those retro games on this system is the best I've ever had on any other handheld. Handheld. And so yes, the Ambernic RG552 is overpriced, but to me, that experience is worth that hefty price. Even if it's not a great deal, it's still a great time. And honestly, that's half the fun of this whole retro handheld landscape. To me, it's never been about what device is the most powerful or the best bang for your buck. Instead, I choose to focus on the gaming experience that is most reminiscent of my childhood and all those nostalgic feelings. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you have an RG552 and do you like it or do you not have one and why? As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.